Yeah, you guys awake today? All right, good. I'm glad to hear it. Good to see you guys and your smiling faces or mask, whichever way you got it. I see it underneath that mask, sir. There it is right there. It's so great to have you guys here this morning. We're going to slow it way down. You know, no matter what you bring in here today, no matter what your week has been or what your month has been or what your past year has been, when you come here, this is the place where you can kind of take a breath and just kind of let it go. Because he is the one that knows. He knows the struggles. He knows what your fears were. He knows uh, your dreams last night. He knows the hope or the hopelessness in your heart. The sadness, he understands. No matter where you're at today, he is a God who heals. He is a God who brings about forgiveness. He is a God who restores. And he is a God who is here. So Father God, right now in this place, we just pray that Lord, you would just have your way. That God, the enemy would try to hold us back or try to have us become cynical, critical, have us become bitter. But Lord, right here in this moment, in this time, your presence is real. Your presence is here. And God, your word says that where your people are, you're there also. So God, you're here. And you're going to move upon people's hearts in the next few moments of time, God, because this is the place. This is where you are. And this is where you move. So Holy Spirit, come. Make this your place.
like I am unashamed I'm gonna shout for joy At the mention of your name I come to worship
God, right now in this moment in time, we just set aside all those distractions, all those hurt feelings, all those ideas, all those things that have hurt us this past week. God, the things that have been said or the things that have been done, God, we can just set that aside right now. You care about them, God, yes. They're valuable, yes. But God, right now in this time and place, the only thing that is important is that we come to you and we say, Holy Spirit, come and invade us. Come and touch our minds. Come and touch our hearts. And the next most of the time as your word come forth, inspire us, encourage us, God. Challenge us in our walk with you. As we're learning from Nehemiah, God, how to change our world and how to change our world and in, 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 in the place and the people we run with, God, I pray that you would inspire today. Lord, I pray that you would invade us with your truth and invade us with your cause and that you would speak clearly to us. That, God, you take us to different places, higher places, places that we've never imagined. That, God, the, the discouragement of this world will not hold us back from overcoming. It will not hold us back from being victorious in Christ. So, Lord, I pray today for every heart, every man, every woman, every child, every teenager, that, Holy Spirit, right now you would allow your calm and your spirit to, and your presence and your peace just to breathe over this place. settle hearts, to calm minds, God, just allow them to know that you are here, and you got them. Thank you, God. Thank you for being here. Thank you for guiding us, and I pray that God, the next most time, you would speak to us, let your word come to life. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You may be seated this morning. Sanballat and Tobiah did everything within their power to stop the work of God's people. Tobiah mocked Nehemiah. If a fox were to climb that wall, it would crumble under his weight. Nehemiah was not deterred and turned to God for strength. This week, how to defeat discouragement and overcome opposition so you can finish the work God called you to do. We are doing this series that is called Change Your World in what? In what? 52 days. And the reason why it's called that, it's the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, is in the Old Testament, so you'll have to open your Bibles to the Old Testament. We don't go there too often. It's kind of like, well, it's old. What do we got to read it? Well, it's very, very powerful. This story is all about the story of Nehemiah and what powerful thing God did to use him to not just change his world, but he changed the lives of many hundreds of thousands of people in just a short 52 days. Now, who is this Nehemiah? Let's recap real quick where we have come, what we have learned. Who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah is a very ordinary person, a simple, a simple ordinary person. In fact, he was a cupbearer. You could say that he was disposable property. That's literally what Nehemiah was. He was a slave. He was taken captive. Many years ago, his ancestors were taken captive by the Babylonians, and then the Assyrians and the Persians, the Medes and Persians came in and took over, and now they're under the Persian rule, and Nehemiah, the cupbearer, what does that mean? He tastes the drink before the king does, and if he croaks, they say, let's not drink that. You imagine, that's his life. He literally has zero value. His value is so minuscule that he's nothing more than a, a, a filter for the king. And so here's Nehemiah, and he's working, serving as a cupbearer one day, and his brother comes in and starts telling him about this city of Jerusalem where he is a, his ancestors are from, that this city of Jerusalem, the walls are completely destroyed in rubble. There's nothing left of them. There's no safety. There's no security. There's nothing for people to have safety in. And at this, as our first week, at this it says that he sat down and he cried. He was so moved with emotion that he said, oh my, how has this happened? Our people are unsafe. They're unsecure. And they're going to lose their life because they have nothing to protect them. Walls in those days, just like in our days, were about protection. They kept out the people that were trying to destroy them. So the walls were in disarray. He sits down and he cries. And some of you, just an ordinary life, God's going to stir you and break your heart for something. And he's going to break your heart and you're going to sit down and you're going to cry. You're going to say, what am I going to cry about? You're going to cry because you're moved with compassion for the broken, for compassion for the vulnerable. 
You're moved to compassion because you see the weak and you see the abused and you see the, those that have been forsaken and you are moved to compassion and you cry. The second thing that he did is he knelt down and he prayed. And some of you are God's going to call you to be prayer warriors. He's going to challenge you to pray for a need or pray for somebody. Some of, you, uh, some of you know someone that's going through a hardship and God's going to cause your heart to break and he's going to cause you to kneel down and pray on their behalf and pray vigilant, vigilantly for their behalf. And the last thing he did is God stirred Nehemiah's heart to get up and to act and do something about it. Some of you, God's going to do that for you. He's going to say, listen, it's not enough just to cry. It's not enough just to pray, but it's time to act. It's time to get outside of your comfort zone. It's time to go. I'm sending you. It's time to stand. I'm, I'm giving you strength to stand. It's time to speak against. It's time to tear down. It's time to act. And so our first week was all about sit, pray, act. Cry, I'm sorry, cry, pray, act. And that was our first week. Then we learned that his heart was stirred a thousand miles away, a thousand miles away. Just imagine that. Imagine that. I don't know how far it is, but I, I, I don't know how far it is from here to Florida. But I don't even think that's a thousand miles. I don't know. Anybody know? Any truckers in here? It's pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close. Thank you. I knew I was right on. <laughs> Call me McNally. <laughs> Some of you got that because you know what McNally is. <laughs> Others of you just, I guess, call me Google Maps. There we go. That's, that's more appropriate. Uh, imagine. Imagine hearing about a, a city that was 1,000 miles away, and he was stirred, and God stirred his heart. And so what does he do? He acts. What does he do? He goes before the Persian king. The Persian king sees he's saddened, sees his heart is heavy, and he notices that that's not the way Nehemiah normally was. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> if I was a cupbearer for the king... It would not be a happy day any day of my life. I don't know about you, but that, it ain't like I'd be walking, hey, king, what are we drinking today? Hey, who wants to kill you today? I'll take it. I'll drink it. I mean, but so this day he was visibly upset, and the king says, what is wrong, Nehemiah? What's going on? He says, I just got news. My city's in ruin. The city of my forefathers is in ruin. It's, it's, it's destroyed. I'm stirred with sadness. And the king said, what can I do for you? Nehemiah had favor with the king. Imagine a cupbearer, ordinary. Nothing really dynamic to draw any attention to him, but yet God stirred the heart of the king to be moved with compassion towards Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, well, king, now we learned last week, he had a plan. He said, well, king, I want to go back and build it. I want to rebuild the walls. But here's what I need, king. This is bold. This is bold. He said, not only do I want to go, but I'm asking you for help for me to go. Will you give me letters so that I have safe passage? And also, king, um, can I dip in? to your forestry money? Can I have money for the lumber to build the gates that I'm going to need to build there, king? And what does the king say? Go. Why? Because Nehemiah, he acted, but when he acted, he had a plan. He put a plan together and carefully designed and prayed about how God is going to accomplish this task. And so Nehemiah's life is pretty good right now. He is, uh, in, in the story where we pick up today, he's at the city. He's building the walls. He goes in, he says, all right, people, the people that were there, we're going to build the walls. They're like, yay, build the walls. And they start building the walls. Everything's pretty good for Nehemiah right now. Nehemiah has letters. Nehemiah has lumber. Nehemiah has the favor of the people. And life is good. But how many of you guys know <laughs> that life isn't always that good? Anybody out there? Raise your hands with me. Come on. How many know, how many know life's good? January a year ago, life was good. Y'all, you know what I'm talking about? Good life. And then it all went down from there. It happened. We got hit. Economy's ruined. Shutdowns happened. COVID's running rampant. We didn't know what to do with it. Life was good. And then all of a sudden, bam. Jose would say, bam, bam, <laughs> got hit, life wasn't so good, listen, any time, any time in life we're moving forward with the things of God, expect opposition to hit you. Nehemiah was not building the wall for himself, you know why? He was a thousand miles away in safety and security of a palace. 
He was at the most safest place there could be. Nehemiah had no reason to go, but God broke his heart. God stirred him to act, and he went, and now he stands, and he's at the middle of this, this, this rubble all around him, and he's looking around, and he's thinking, oh, life is good. <laughs> Just wait. Because when you move forward with the things of God, there will always be opposition to come your way. How do we defeat discouragement when we get hit? How do we, how do we stand up when we get hit by life? Because here's the facts. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the enemy, the thief, the enemy of our soul comes to steal to kill, and to what? Destroy. That he comes to ruin and wreck your life. The Bible says that he is like a roaring lion, prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. Lion. Cat family. No more needs to be said. <laughs> so blessed whenever my growing up and in, in my home, we were so blessed and so happy to keep cats out of our family. And then my son goes and marries a cat lady. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me say, uh, sickness and in health. That's sickness right there. That's sickness. <laughs> That cat is, that cat, her name's Bella. She is a mean cat. Yesterday, I went by to help Tyler with something. That cat walked by, and I swear, it spoke in another language and cussed me out. I don't know what it was. It was scary. That cat is scary. Her belly's so big, it rattles the floor as it drives along. <laughs> anyway, back on to what I need to say. Anytime we move forward with God... There will be opposition to try to push its way back. Anytime you try to do something great in your marriage, there'll be opposition trying to push its way back. Anytime you try to do something powerful for your kids, there'll be opposition to try to push its way back. Why? Because when we try to move forward with God and we try to do things, it's not easy. When you try to stand in culture, when culture is going one direction and you're being countercultural, it is not easy. Anybody out there? This is the truth. When you stand and you move forward, there will be opposition, and that's exactly what happened to Nehemiah. Things are going great. The wall is being built. The lumber is being cut. The gates are being put up. But just as soon as Nehemiah thinks he's going to get just easy and just going to make life grand and is going to complete it, opposition comes its way. When God pushes us forward, the enemy tries to push us back. Throughout my life, I have seen this take place. Throughout my life, anytime I've tried to take a stand or to push my way forward, I have been met with opposition. Not just opposition of, of family and friends, but opposition of, of people that I thought would be in my corner. Opposition that I thought they were on board. Why? Because when we try to move forward in God, the enemy will push his way back. Two different ways I want to show you today that the enemy will push his way back in your life. The first one is this. The enemy will attempt to discourage you from the outside. Here's what happens. There'll be external pressure. There'll be external consequences, external things that'll come your way. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, here's what it says. Here's, here's what happened to Nehemiah. It says, when Sambalat heard that they were built, that we were building a wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And the presence of his associates and the army of, of, of uh, sorry, I got it. Samaria. Man, that was word was hard. I saw it, but I couldn't say it. He said, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? What are those weak people trying to do? 
Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Just meh, meh, meh. Then it says, can they bring the stones back to life, those heaps of rubble? That, that garbage they're working with, they're burned. Tobiah, another person said, Tobiah the Ammonite said this, who was on his side? He, he said, what they are building, if even a fox climbed up on that thing, he would break it down. So Father, help us today in discouragement. Help us when ridicule comes our way. Help us to know who we are. Help us to know where we stand. And most importantly, help us to keep our eyes on the cause and not get distracted when the enemy presses in. So Lord, I pray you do that in Jesus' name. There are two specific ways that the enemy, whenever you step out, whenever you begin to strive to do things powerful for God, and when you strive to move things forward, two specific ways that the enemy will come against you. First one, he'll come against you by facing obstacles, physical things in your way, trying to get you discouraged about what you're doing. Here's an example. For example, maybe God is stirring you and your family to get out of debt, especially what we just came through. Maybe God is stirring you to get out of debt because you don't want to owe anybody anything. And you want to, you want to be able to, if your job was saying, hey, we're going to have to downsize, you can say, that's all right, we're good. You're, you have that freedom in life. And so the minute you step out to do, here's what you do. You, you get a hold of some, some financial materials. You get home a hold of Dave Ramsey and Larry Briquette. And you start reading and you start learning. You get yourself on a budget. And I ain't talking about a, a make-believe budget. I'm talking a budget you live by. And like you, you're counting receipts and you're counting pennies. You get in the envelope system. You know what the envelope system is? You only work on cash. You cut up your credit cards. You literally uh, take and you cut them up and you burn those babies. You say, we're not going back to credit. And you live on cash and you get vigilant and you get almost aggressive about it. And you're like, we're getting out of debt. We're getting out of debt. I'm tired of debt. You're aggressive about it. And then all of a sudden, the car breaks down. And you have nothing to be able to pay for that car. Face obstacles. You feel called to lead your family spiritually. You're going to pray with your family. You're going to do devotions with your family. You're going to talk kinder to your family. You're going to be more gentle with your family. And you're like, oh, God, this is the right thing. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better uh, a better mother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat my kids right. And I'm not going to talk down to them. And I'm not going to yell at them. I'm going to be like, it's going to be like uh, Mr. Rogers in our home. It's going to be quiet and peaceful. And oh, it's okay, guys. Let's get our rooms clean. It's going to be just fine. Let's pray with each other. And let's read the Bible together. And that's your goal. And then they act stupid. <laughs> or they wake up. <laughs> right? You all know what I'm talking about? Wife and husband, we're going to make our marriage better. We're going to work hard at it. We're going to treat each other with respect. We're going to honor each other. And then all of a sudden, you wake up and realize, who is this I married? What are we going to get through this? Obstacles will come our way. Not only are we going to be faced with obstacles, but the second way that we're from the outside is this. Discouragement from the outside is criticism. Criticism will come your way. Sanballat and Tobiah, they criticize the Jewish people. Who are these people? What, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're not able to do this. They're feeble. They're weak. They'll never be able to accomplish this. What are they thinking? Can't even use those bricks. They're dummies. They, they're, so, they're so unsmart. They're not smart people. Unsmart's not a word. I just really showed how unsmart I am. <laughs> not smart. This happens in our life. You feel called to foster or to adopt a child. Discouragement comes your way and they say, what are you thinking? You shouldn't do that. You got your own kids to raise. You can barely raise them and you want to raise somebody else's? You don't have the goods. You can't take care of them. So why try? Some of you, God's going to call you possibly to leave a higher, a high paying job to go to a lower-paying job that gives you better hours to be with your family. 
The minute you step out and do it, the minute they're going to like, what are you thinking? This world, in our world and day in which you live, you're going to leave money on the table? You're crazy. You need to take everything you can get because people will face you with criticism. You're called to work with kids or work with teenagers to help them through the struggles of their life, and people will look at you and say, you were one messed up kid. You really think you can help somebody else's kid out? You don't have it together. Well, how can you ever help somebody else? Listen, if you're going to change the world, God's going to call you to do something significant. And it's going to cause you to get outside of what is comfortable. Nehemiah, Nehemiah got criticized. The Tobiah and, and Samuelit said, ha, you're never going to do it. You're never going to make it happen. You know what? You know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah got on Twitter and started tweeting out about, these people are jerks. Don't listen to them. Nehemiah got on Facebook and said, I don't know, you know, really ambiguous. Somebody said something to me, and it was completely wrong, but trust me, that's not what it is. Is that what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah, you know what he did? He, he called up all his friends and got all his allies with him and said, hey, come join me. They're fighting me, but it's okay. Be on my side. Nehemiah did not do any of that. You know what Nehemiah did? First thing he did. Here's the first thing he did. He took it to God. He cried out to God. He said, this hurts. I'm being criticized, and he cried out to God. And the second thing he did, he got up, and he went back to work. He didn't, he didn't complain. He didn't argue. He didn't fight. He just took it to God and got back to work. Do people ever criticize you? Anybody ever been criticized about anything? Let's see your hands. I'll wait. I'll wait till you get them up. Everybody get them up. You ever been criticized? It's okay. Some of you are so perfect, never been criticized. God love you. Ever been criticized? Yeah, we've all been criticized. Been talked about. We've been hurt. All of us have. Every single one of us have. Not a single one of us can go without that. Not just personally, but every one of us, our families have been attacked in some way. Things have been said. I know that that's always a hard thing for anybody is for the family to be attacked. We've all been attacked. We've all been criticized. Not one of us get by on a pass without being criticized. But we have to be careful how we handle the criticism. We take it to God. We ask God to help us, and we get back to work. If you have criticisms for myself, which I get just one or two every now and then, you can send your criticisms to Kevin at I don't give a crap .com, and I'll be sure to answer them there. Or you can text me. You can text me at get a, hashtag get a life, and I'll respond to that one. Because the fact is, you will be opposed from the outside, and you will be, have obstacles, and you will have criticism come your way. Second thought I have is this. Your enemy not only will attack you from the outside, but your enemy will discourage you from the inside. And this is one that I think is more powerful than the outside. Because honestly, from the outside, we can kind of write it off. From the outside, we can kind of move past it. But the stuff that comes from the inside is what really hurts. Here's what happened. Verse 10, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of our laborers given out. And there is so much rubble, we cannot rebuild this wall, Nehemiah. So here is the discouragement. There's discouragement from the outside, but now it's happening on the inside of the camp. Now they're starting to doubt what they're doing. Now they're starting to doubt that God can do it. They're starting to question why they ever started in the first place. See, whenever God is doing something powerful, when God is moving and, and, and when God is, is moving you forward, discouragement will come from the inside. People will judge. People will be misunderstood. They'll misunderstand your intentions. They'll misunderstand why you do what you do. But you must understand that when discouragement comes, you stand and you do what God's called you. Now, I'll tell you right now, this is going to be a shocker to so many of you in this place. But I'm not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Never claimed to be perfect from this pulpit. I struggle. I'm transparent. 
I try to be very real with each one of you because only in that reality we find strength to continue on. Some people oftentimes will try to remind me of my failures or my failures as a leader. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to remind me of my failures as a leader. I remind myself every single day. I know who I am. I know my internal struggles. Unlike every one of you, just the same goes for you. You know your struggles way more than I do. I don't know what your struggles are, but you know what your struggles are. And when God is calling you to do something great, there will be internal struggles. When God is calling you to defend the unborn, when God is calling you to, to help the hungry, to help feed the hungry, when God is calling you to work with teens, when God is calling you to help girls and boys that have been in, in families with incest to help them find healing, when God is calling you to work with victims of, of domestic violence, when God is calling you to, to work with those that are struggling with alcohol, alcohol addiction, when God is calling you to work with the drug dealers, all those things that God calls us to do, when you step out and when you begin to do it, the minute you do, the enemy is going to say, you're not good enough. You can't do that. Who do you think you are? How do you think you have the right to tell them what to do? I can promise you that when you step out in faith, and when you step out to do something great, the enemy will be there to say, you're nobody. Just stay, just stay where you are. Just don't do anything. Your spiritual enemy will tell you, back down, compromise, don't do it. When discouragement comes in like that, when you feel unworthy, when you feel like you can't make it, when you feel like you can't go on, just like these guys, the laborers, they're giving out. They're giving up, they're discouraged, they're weak, they're tired. They don't know how they're going to make it happen. And Nehemiah is standing there going, what have I done? I started this task. I've got the favor of the king and a few critics come in, a few people say things, and all of a sudden my people want to give up. Nehemiah in verse, chapter 4, verse 14, a few verses later it says this. After I looked things over, so just stop for a second. Nehemiah stopped his work, and he started looking around. He looked. He said, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, he said this, <laughs> don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. What does he say? Say it with me. Remember the Lord. Say it again. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And what? Fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah, for just a brief second, he takes his eye off the prize and he starts to get a little bit internally discouraged. He starts to look around and he goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hey, you all, remember your God and what he can do and he can pull this through. And if you're gonna do it, don't do it for yourself. You do it for your children. You do it for your wives. You do it for your homes. You do it, you fight because it's the right thing to do. It takes me to my last two thoughts I wanna give you. Whenever you're in the middle of the crux, whenever you're in the middle of the discouragement, whenever it feels like all the world has beat you down, when you're crying out and you're discouraged and you feel defeated, I want you to number one, remember the Lord your God and he, how awesome he is. He said, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord. Here's what they did. The children of Israel looked around at the rubble, and they said, okay, we're in the middle of this rubble. We're in the middle of all this stuff. But I remember when we were in slavery in Egypt, and God rose a man up named Moses, and Moses heard from a burning bush, and a burning bush told him, go and save my people in Egypt. And he goes, and he, he didn't even have, he was an ordinary man. He couldn't talk very well. In fact, they said he could barely speak, and he was sent to Pharaoh. And he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no way way, no how, get out. And, and, and Moses leaves, an ordinary man, Moses leaves, and he, he goes away, and God sends the plagues upon Egypt. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh's like, all right, come back and get them. Come back. You can take them out of here. And he takes them out, but it wasn't too long after they take them out. What happened? 
Pharaoh changed his mind, says, nope, go get my slaves, go get my property. And they begin to chase after him. They come to this, the Red Sea, and all of a sudden, the Egypt's are behind him, the Red Sea in front of him. And what does Moses do? He lifts his hands up, the seas part, and the, the Israelite children cross on dry ground. They get on the other side, and all of a sudden, when the Egyptians run after them, the sea collapses and engulfs all of them, and they pursue them no longer. Why? Because we must remember that when the enemy attacks, no matter what the obstacles are that our God will bring us through. If we keep our eye on the prize and we fight through, no matter where we go, he will take us through. I don't know if anybody's getting this today. I'm getting exhausted by preaching up here, but I'm preaching some good stuff today. When you're discouraged, when you're discouraged and when you feel like you can't go on and you have the enemy behind you and the sea that is impossible in front of you, you have to keep your eyes and remember what he did because that's the only thing that's going to get you through. Remember the Lord when you're discouraged. Remember the Lord when people talk. Remember the Lord when you feel like you're all alone, remember his greatness and his awesomeness. Every single one of us in this room can remember something that God did for us. Every single one. Just think. Just take a, let's take just 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Think about a time that God has been faithful to you, if not to you, to someone in your life. Can we just do that? When you have something, when you remember something, put your hand up. When you remember something, put your hand up. Something didn't take, it didn't take but seconds, right? Yeah. Remember his faithfulness. I remember, I've preached about this, I remember when my mom was diagnosed with cancer. I remember the sadness, the fear, the anxiety that came on me as a teenage boy. I remember, I remember the stories, and I remember being vaguely connected and one time very connected to here when Pastor Terry had his heart attacks. And I remember going to the hospital. And I remember him in the middle of his heart attack that he was going through, him at the ER. And I remember, wasn't griping, he wasn't crying, he was in his way saying, God, you've got me, God, I thank you, God. He was praying the whole time. I remember that, that inspired my life, that encouraged me, because here was a man in the middle of brink of what could possibly be the last moments of his life, and he didn't get discouraged, he didn't get defeated, he kept his eyes on the one who was faithful to take him through. Remember the loss in your life. Remember that God has been faithful. Whenever I go through discouraging times, I remind myself of the Lord and his faithfulness. I remind myself that he is for me. And if my God is for me, then no one nor nothing can be against me. For he will come and he will be, he will be my God. Number one, we remember the Lord. That's how we fight discouragement. We fight discouragement by remember the Lord and what he's done in your life. The second thought I have for you, you is this. Fight for your cause. Fight for your cause. Don't fight for yourself. You're not fighting for yourself. You don't fight for yourself. Fathers, husbands, wives, mothers, you're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for your kids and you're fighting for your, your, your generations to come. You're not fighting for yourself. Nehemiah, he looks around he surveys what's happening, and he says, okay, okay, let me get you back in focus here. You're not building the wall for you. You're building the wall for your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. That's why you're building. So when you build, don't give up. Don't surrender. He says, Nehemiah says, your enemy's going to attack you. Yep, he's going to come. So put a sword in one hand and build with the other. <laughs> what? What? You're going to continue to fight. Because I'm telling you right now, there is a very real enemy of your soul. and you, uh, Just hear me. There is a very real enemy of your soul, and he hates you. His goal in life is to destroy you. 
Now, sometimes we say, what do I ever do to him? Why does he care so much about me? You know why he cares about you? Because you were created in God's image. You are the masterpiece of God. You were given free will to receive or reject God and no one else, no, nothing else has ever been given that power but you. And because you serve God and because you accept Christ and because you live for him every day, he hates you. He wants to destroy your wife, your husband. He wants to destroy your home. He wants to destroy your kids. He wants to destroy your job. He hates you. Satan hates you. But just as much as he hates you, God fights and loves you. What can separate us from the love of God? Can height their debts? No. Angels or demons? No. For I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. The enemy fights. The enemy is real. Discouragement is real. But you fight. You fight and you work. You fight and you build the wall. You fight and you serve. You fight and you pray. You fight and you cry. You fight, you fight, and you fight. You fight the enemy. But you don't fight in your own strength. You fight in the power of the overcoming resurrection of Jesus Christ. You stand because you know who is on your side. You don't have to fight with words. You don't have to fight with Facebook. You don't have to fight with social media. That's immature. That's passive aggressive, and that's not of God. You stand, and you stand your ground, and you know who you are, and you say, God, I remember all the good things you've done, and I remember that I'm going to continue to press on and become who you called me to become. You don't ever give up. You don't ever give up. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your wife. Don't give up on your husband. Don't give up on the thing that God's called you to do. You don't give up. You fight. Remember, the greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world, and therefore I will not let the world determine my worth. Hmm. I'm going to say that again because that was good. That wasn't even, that's not in my notes. That's free. It's good stuff. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So therefore, the world will not determine my worth or my value. Girls, you hear that? That's good. The world can't tell you who you are. God has. This is... This is what Nehemiah is all about. It's about standing and building something that will last forever. Those walls that were built, those walls that they built in 52 days are walls that protected that, that nation for years to come because a few people stood up and they fought because they believed that God had called them to something greater than they could ever do on their own. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, Help us today to see that. Help us, God, today to, to recognize that when we step out and when we step into places and we begin to stand and we begin to go countercultural, that God, when the culture pushes this way, God, you call us to push the other. The Lord, we're going to be criticized. We're going to be, we're going to be mocked. We're going to be told that we're wrong. We're going to, but God, we must remember your faithfulness and we must fight the fight you've called us to fight. God, today, within the sound of my voice, there's discouragement in this room. God, there are those here today that, God, they feel like life has really beat them down. God, there are parents that are discouraged because 
They're watching their kids walk down paths of destruction and that they feel powerless to help. Father, there's others here today that teenagers that have believed the lies of the world that says this is their identity, this is the way they should look, and this is, this is how they need to dress, and this is who they are. But God, it's such a lie because it's what the world says and not what you say, God. It's not who you say we are. Fathers, others in this place, I believe you're stirring them to do great things in the kingdom of God. I believe you're stirring some of them here to go and maybe witness or tell someone in their workplace about who Jesus is. Others, God, you're, you're challenging them to survey their life and how they can step up and be a Christ follower in a more real, authentic way so that others may know who Jesus is because of their lifestyle that they're changing. God, there's marriages in here today that need healing. Husbands that are discouraged, wives that are discouraged. But Lord, I pray and I ask you in the next few moments of time that you would bring about your healing. That you remind us about who you are. That God, you stir in our souls a purpose to fight because we know that you are for us. God, if you are for us, then no one or nothing can be against us. I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come now. trying to just obey what I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying and so just if you would just be indulge me just go with me a little bit tonight today you're here today and man discouragement has hit you heavy your soul is heavy you're saddened in your heart you feel almost maybe empty and alone you almost feel like you're you know there's nobody with you and you feel like you've been maybe abandoned or feel like you don't really want to go on because you're just so weak and so weary from the journey and if that's you here today I just want to encourage you that he is for you and if he is for you no one is against you and no matter what you're facing no matter how hard life may seem no matter how big the obstacle may appear God is bigger and God is for you so today you can know that he is with you by remembering how faithful he's been in the past and by continuing to press on for what he's called you to. If you're here this morning, I just want to do something I don't normally do, but I just, if you're here and you're discouraged today, you're just finding the discouragement, you're finding heaviness in your heart, heaviness about maybe something that you're going through or something your family's going through, would you just lift your hands all across this place? I want to pray with you today and just pray, a, a pray a, a over you as you go through that journey through that. Just lift them up. Thank you, God, that we have one we call on. These hands that are raised are souls and hearts that are discouraged and heavy. And so, Lord, right now, I pray that you speak to those lives, that God, not only do you speak to them, but you encourage them right now. Let them know they're not alone. Let them know that God, as they as they have journeyed, you've been there every step of the way. That God, as they raise their hands, they're crying out to a God who can heal, to a God who restores, to a God who encourages. And so right now, God, be their strength. Just like Nehemiah, as he looked around and he said, okay, we're not going to be afraid. God, we lift our hands right now and we say, we will not be afraid for you are for me. And because you are for me, no one or nothing can be against me. And because no one or nothing is against me, I am victorious. Not because of me, but because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So therefore I stand, not in my victory. I lift my hands. Lift them up high right now. I lift my hands not in my victory, but I lift it in the one who overcame death, hell, and the grave. Jesus, you are my victory. Jesus, you are my strength. And Jesus, you will bring me through this discouragement. Thank you, Jesus. 
for being my source, for being my hope, for being my strength. Sing that again. I know that you are for me. Lift your hands and let's sing it. I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come now, even if to ride upon my heart, to remind me of who enough but Jesus you remembered who God was and why you were here and you fought Jesus you fought you fought all the way through until three days later you overcame death hell and the grave and that is why we are victorious today because you fought so therefore we can fight we can stand even though the enemy attacks, and even though we get beat down at times, Lord, we get discouraged, we will not give up. Lord, we'll fight for our families. We'll fight 
on our knees. We'll fight in our everyday life because why? It's worth fighting for. Because you are for us. No one or nothing can be against us. So Lord, I pray, take this word of Nehemiah today and may it stir our hearts this week. May it challenge us every day to fight, to fight, to work, to fight, to serve, to fight, to build, to fight the good fight for you. So Lord, I pray you watch over each person that is here. Thank you so much for being with us. Help us to bless Lydia's house over the next several weeks as we donate to them, God. May you bless those endeavors. God, for our final days of 10-day prayer and fasting, let us dedicate it back to you, God, and trust you. And God, finally, as we come together next Sunday for worship, Lord, may you fill this place and may you touch our hearts and stir us to greater places because you're so good and you are for us. So God, watch over us, keep us in your hand. And everybody said... Hey, be careful out there. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Love you. Keep fighting the good fight.